everyone thank you so much for taking some time out of your day to spend with me welcome to another video this is joy i want to talk to you today about how the narcissist fears death you know when you consider the narcissist that you've encountered in your life you can probably to some degree picture that person who acted bold fearless and as if they were somebody to be feared but when the tables turn and life has run its course the narcissist is completely fearful they are afraid of death there is no denying it there is no there's there's just no ignoring it they are afraid of death if there is one thing that they are truly afraid of i understand that while they are still living exposure is what they are truly afraid of but when you know that your number is here they are definitely afraid of death you know when it comes to when it comes to faith and knowing the existence of God, it doesn't matter whether you're a believer or a non-believer. I'm fully convinced that we are all hardwired with the knowledge of the existence of God. We are all spiritual beings having a earthly experience. And as we get closer to the end of life, and I'm talking about the very end of life, the body, the physical body begins to shut down. And as the physical body begins to shut down, you find that the person that is about to transition begins to lose interest in, in life. They stop talking to people. They stop interacting. They, um, they're not interested in food and water. And that's simply because they're in preparation to move on to the next phase of their existence. But as their physical body shuts down, their spiritual body begins to awaken. You see, there is a very thin veil between the physical and the spiritual realm. And it's just like one part becomes clearer to them than it is to us. We still need food. We still need water. We still need human interactions. And so we involve ourselves in those things. They're just the opposite at that point. You know, what happens with narcissists is that they, they, they may have a form of godliness and that's because they may be your, your spiritual narcissists, but even them, they deny the power of God right up until the very end. We are all hardwired to know that there is a God and it becomes so evident as as you know as people begin to make that transition towards the end of life there is so many instances and i'm sure like you you may have had such an experience yourself where you you know somebody who had an awareness that their life was coming to an end there's this sweet lady i used to fellowship with at this church i went to and she was you know she was about to pass away but it wasn't that she was sick at the moment or anything like that. It was most likely, it was probably about a month or so before she did pass. And she said to me, she said, you know, Joy, um, you know, she said her, she was, she was saying goodbye to me. She said, this is the very last time you're going to see me. It's most likely the last time that we're going to talk. And I just wanted you to know that I love you. And I, I thank you for being part of my life. And I'm thinking like, what are you doing? Why is she saying all this? And I'm thinking, don't worry, we'll see each other again. And she was right. I was wrong. She passed away shortly thereafter, and I was left thinking like, wow, if only, if only, you know, I would have caught what she was saying for real that day, then I would have been able to say a goodbye to her too. But it went, it went over my head. When people are about to transition, for the most part, they are fully aware of it. All of us. And this is just another show of God's goodness and his grace because we have that opportunity to to seek him and to be repentant towards him. But when it comes to narcissists, 
they are unrepentant and it is for this very reason that they fear death the word is very clear when God says that vengeance belongs to him he knows that the lake of fire is there and is inescapable for any unrepentant person and more than anything this becomes clear to them at the end of life or towards the end of life for those of you who um, are listening to me for the first time and are not aware I I do a lot of um, volunteering for hospice so I sit with so many different people over and over again as they make their transitions I've sat with some of the most incredible souls and I have sat, sat with some who have had very challenging passings and I've had the privilege of talking to all their families who share about who this person is or was for some of them I, I don't get to say any words to them but their vile and toxic behavior shows the moment you step on the scene and you know it's difficult to see this because you see the fear in their eyes it is evident it's evident and during the stages of you know of transitioning there are lots of their periods of rest where you know they sleep a lot and when you have a person who who is you know for all people really i've seen it happen with with your toxic and your non-toxic your non-narc and the narcs you find that there is like there is sometimes a, a shaking and when i say a shaking i mean something going on on the inside of them that they cannot express to you it's it's an internal work they can't express this or they can't tell it to anybody and a lot of the times you get that you get the feeling that they're too scared to say what's going or they simply don't have the words other times it just feels like they're not even permitted to share what is happening because they want to tell you and you see the looks on their faces like whoa but when you have the believer and you and you begin to bring forth the word and you go forth in prayer because it doesn't matter whether they believe or they don't for my, for me to be able to be in that space at that time as somebody transitions I have to, I have to be in the word I need worship music going forward I need to be in prayer because the air or the atmosphere is always thick it's always thick and when I say it's thick it, you feel the different presences of whatever their of whatever their destiny is it's there in the atmosphere and for me to stay grounded and be professional and to really be loving and supportive regardless of who they are and what they did in order for me to stay in the mind frame that listen God is here he's in charge he's in control offer salvation pray with this person pray with their family because it's not just that um they're you know in hospice to you know to sit with the person their families are there sometimes their families are scared their families are experiencing loss and so you know their hearts are breaking so I must be able to pray with them and for them and be fully present so I can serve them and their needs completely at that time and so I have to have you know prayer and worship going on I need the word because it keeps me <laughs> in the right mind frame um, and so you know because <laughs> it's <laughs> birth and death are when we're those those times in life that's when we're most close to God and so when somebody's making that transition you know I just want to do my part to say that I helped or to say that you know I was there to serve in do my part at the end of the day but when it comes to the narcissist right 
you find that they remain committed to their ways right to the end. God says vengeance belongs to him. And it, do, and it doesn't register with them until the very end. They continue to bring confusion to their deathbeds. They offer chaos to their family to the end and they don't apologize. You see families begging, family members begging and asking for closure, asking what did you mean when you said these things? Why, why, why? Why don't you love me? Why did you treat this one? But I'm the one who is here for you and you still won't accept me. You see their pain and the narc will just turn away or they'll laugh or they'll be just remain committed to their ways to the very end and that's a very painful thing to see especially when you want to see them saved because at the end of the day you want you know we want as many souls to experience um you know life with god afterwards but they don't want that but they never you know they never apologize and <laughs> It's like they simply don't feel sorry and have no remorse for any harm that they did to anybody throughout their lives. Now, you know, this is where we can even talk a little bit about the difference between the people who have narcissistic traits, but are not actual full blown, full blown narcissists. They have the traits, but they don't have MPD. They may still experience empathy. And so you'll find that those ones, those ones you can reach, those ones will accept the gospel of salvation at the end. They'll give their family members the closure that they want, that they seek, that they deserve. But when we have the full blown person with, or the per person with NPD, they don't have the empathy Therefore, their fate is sealed. Their fate is sealed. And I say this, you know, and it's difficult to say this because they, they just will not repent. There's no empathy there. There's no remorse. There's no regret. There's no shame in their game. To the very end they will do whatever they can to try to prolong their lives so you find that when people get certain diagnoses of sickness they begin to try to manipulate systems and situations they'll try to use their last dollar to try to extend their life if they could say like listen I um, I'm wealthy and I've got all this money and doctor keep me alive they would do that if they could but they can't it doesn't work like that you know you know I'm African right and so within within certain within within some of our more primitive um, brethren right there used to be a belief that for those that were those that had um, AIDS if they slept with a virgin they would be able to be cured from that HIV or that diagnosis and we had them out we had so many cases of children not even an, an adult virgin, but children, innocent children being raped and infected with AIDS. Never had a chance at life. Never had a chance at life. And when I say this, this is how this is how evil they are. And this is how they think that they can trick god this is how they think that they can cheat death some will if they could be on life support forever they would be on life support forever simply because they do not want to to experience their judgment and you know for me this is why i tend to believe that narcissists the people are actually possessed 
hear my hear my logic a demon can't do anything without a body it just can't do anything it needs a host it needs a host to be able to operate from and so if this person has made themselves available for this demon to come in and they are okay with the demon being in them and ruling their decisions or influencing their decisions then it works for them you know there you, that 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 wickedness can continue to go forward and the work of the enemy continues to go forward because there's a body that is willing and able so what I'm trying to say is that this, you know, that demon does not want to give up the host. And so they find evil ways to try to stay alive. And when I say evil ways, I was referencing to how they were raping these young children to try to prolong their lives. Doesn't make a lick of sense to a normal person, but that's what they were doing. It doesn't make any sense. But they will always try to cheat death. Um, so here's here's the transparent part of today's video. I've shared for those of you who don't know, I've shared how I was sexually assaulted by at four. I was four when it happened, and it was a family member. It you know I because they're a family member I got I had a front seat to their life so you know I, I get to I understand when you know when I see your comments and we have conversations and you say it always looks like the narc is winning because thinking back on it now he was forever winning he was always you know he, he was wealthy he was always he was always you know he was it, oh, it just looked like he was successful at everything that he ever did there was always a you know a string of women and all of those things but then there was me there was the four-year-old me it didn't matter how much how old i got but there was that always that four-year-old version of me who was still crying who was still lost who was still hurt who is seeing that you did this to me but you're going on through life like god how does this make any sense but god continued to tell me trust me have blind faith and <laughs> I didn't understand it and it's only now that I'm much older that I understand it's only now because I spent three decades mourning the loss of my innocence 31 years I was in mourning and here's the thing here's what I want to say today that is going to confirm the narcissist fear of death and everything that I've shared with you so far. When I was 13, this same sexual predator that was a family member of mine passed away. Because he was because of the nature of the relationship, the family relationship, I had a front seat to see the passing. Now, I'm not saying that I was there the moment he passed but I was very close. Again, um, we, within our African culture, we do things a little differently. And so I had, I got to see a lot. Being in the same room with this person. Oh, and before I, we go too far, he was dying of AIDS. So it's kind of like poetic justice. You couldn't keep it in your pants when it came to a child. And it's the very thing that took him out. I'm just saying. So, so you know, <laughs> there I am. And I'm thinking, wow, I wonder if now will the sorry come? I wonder with now, would there be... I wish I didn't do this to you or you know an open a public admission of what happened no there was none 
There was none whatsoever. Till the end, he put on the facade of being a saint. He put on the facade of being somebody who, you know, who loved me. This is somebody like, you know, he did that to me. I was the golden child to him. This is not my father, but it was a close male family member. I was like the one he put on a pedestal when it came to all the children within the family, me, cousins, and everything. But this is the treatment that I got. I was always compared to the other people or everybody else was compared to me. I was the one to be. But this is what he did to me. This is the pain that he inflicted that I spent years having to work hard to undo. You know... So there was no pleasure, there was no joy, there was nothing special about being that golden child. But, again, denied reality right to the very end. And then not only that, that was one of the most difficult passings that I had to witness. And it's not that I had to witness because I was made to be there. I wanted to see. There was that something in me that wanted to see. I guess a part of me wanted to see, is that sorry going to come? It didn't come. And I'm not the only person that he hurt. I just don't know everybody else's story who was there. I don't know their story. I was only 13. They weren't going to tell me everything. But it was evident that there was a lot of hurt. And, you know, I'm sharing this. And I chose to share this part of my story with you today. For those of you that are are like me, who were, who are, you know, like how I used to be, always wanting that sorry that never came. It's not going to come. And that's okay. It's okay. We're going to have to be okay with that, not getting that apology. Because it's in God's hand. And vengeance belongs to Him. There is nothing that that sorry is going to fix. He could have come and said sorry to me. But I would still have had years and years and years of work to do to heal. If the narcissist came and gave you the closure that you were seeking, you still have the work to do. You would still have to ask yourself or you would still, you know, you would still wonder to yourself, but why me? Why did you choose me for this? There would still be more questions. And so because we don't get that apology, because we don't get that closure, because we don't get it from them, we create it for ourselves. But I want you to know that their day of reckoning is coming. And this is not for us to get at all, you know, happy and celebrate because it's truly a frightening thing for them. It's their reality. It's set in stone. I just don't want to see you give up years of your life stuck in a holding pattern by, by, you know, stuck in a holding pattern waiting for an apology that's not coming. Their fate is sealed. It's something that they will try to run from, but there is no escaping it. They can't talk their way out of it. They can't buy their way out of it. They can't deceive their way out of it. When the end comes, they know that the end has come and that they made wrong choices their entire life. But because they are who they are, they remain married to that choice to the very end. 
I hope that this is helpful to you. I hope that this answers some questions that you may have had. I thank you so much for your time. Have a good night.